construction, renovations, you know, maybe by a different property type, that sort of thing. So what did you find? Um, so the first one, we kind of like, I mean, from what we did, was we, uh, we looked at different, uh, there was not really actual, like a lot of local governments that actually implement a certain rule. Yes, so, they are. There absolutely are. Uh, yeah. Do you mean like in terms of like, they were at, with absolute set requirements of saying that all new buildings or renovations yeah, must be of a certain that, standard. Okay. I found a website that um, tells you all the municipalities and counties in Florida that require, not require, they that have LEED certified options and they tell you all the standards you have to follow. Okay. So we got conflicting information from those two teams. All right, who else on the first issue? We found um, a website, but it had all the states. So well, different major cities in different states. So like for example, on here if we look at um, I'm just trying to pick one that's not super long. Like San Francisco, it says here that commercial buildings between five thousand and twenty five thousand square feet have to complete a lead checklist, newly constructed and renovated commercial buildings over 25,000 square feet must be lead gold certified. Okay. So, so in other words, all I really want you to do is to find at least one or more examples of where a local government has put into place some sort of a, of a requirement for a certain level of certification. Robert? Well, we found that Phoenix was an example of one that... Okay, what do they require? All new municipality buildings built with 2006 bond funds to be LEED certified. Okay, so that's an example of a, of a local government requiring it. Well, the federal government, this was several years ago, the General Services Administration, which is the, the main governmental sort of property manager for the federal government, now that this, this includes virtually all federal buildings are managed by the GSA. Well, if you read the headline, they require now LEED gold for all new buildings and major renovations. Now, one of the reasons that they did this was obviously not only to show that they were being progressive, it really wasn't so much that. Here's, here's the thing. This is one of the lessons about this whole kind of energy efficiency, LEED certification thing that we really didn't talk about, and that is the following. <coughs> For governments and for nonprofits, think about this for a second. It is extremely easy to get upfront money to build a building if you are a nonprofit or a governmental entity. What is more difficult is getting money that sustains the building in terms of operating costs, okay? Think about it like this. You potentially, you know, have some sort of affiliation with a nonprofit. Could be a church, could be a school, could be a hospital, could be, you know, a whole variety of uses, or for that matter, which is again, a government facility. It's gonna be really easy for you to go to your constituents and, and say, okay, we wanna raise a lot of money to build this new building, and we want to make it obviously energy efficient so you can kind of sell people on that. And that is a sort of campaign, if you will, that can get people excited. What doesn't get people excited, if you think about fundraising things, is to say, we need constantly every year more money to pay our electric bill or more money to pay our, you know, landscaping bill or more money to, to, to do with this. So if you can spend, you know, my, my, my argument with this is, if you can spend more money up front as a governmental entity or as a nonprofit and get a highly, highly, highly energy efficient building, that's probably gonna work to your advantage simply because you're gonna have more difficulty in getting the operating cost on ongoing basis. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Okay, so there is a method to the madness as it relates to this. Okay, whereas the individual sort of average ordinary kind of, of occupant or you know tenant of a, of a building, you know, it's maybe a little bit more of a challenge for them to say, yeah, we're willing to spend all that extra money up front to get those cost savings for several years into the future, because you know, with them, they're really looking for a very quick payback. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so there's definitely a, a conflict there. Okay, so like I said, that was the, the sort of the lead certification with regard to kind of federal buildings. Another example that I found was in Canada, Vancouver was one of the first cities within North America to require LEED Gold certification on a lot of their um, office buildings. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those sorts of things, you know, do we as, you know, local governments or federal government, you know, by requiring these kind of, of higher standards, you know, is that a way, you know, really to, you know, help drive down energy consumption and is there a, a, you know, a method to our madness with that? Well, here's another angle we haven't talked about. Who provides electricity? In many cases, it is a local government or some sort of a quasi-governmental entity, okay? Well, you know, whoever it, it may be. Now, you know, once again, it varies from across the country or across, you know, the world for that matter. In some cases, it actually is a governmental entity. In other cases, it's a quasi-governmental entity. In other cases, it's a private sector supplier. But my point with that is that one of the things that the people don't fully understand as it relates to power generation or as it relates to water treatment plants is that as a general rule, if you need extra capacity, it's not simply as simple as adding another little generator to produce more power. In most instances, it's a massive incremental step that you have to take as that power provider to provide that excess capacity, okay? In terms of building a massive coal-powered, you know, uh, electric generating plant or a water treatment facility or whatever it may be. And so it comes in very big chunks, okay? So if you think about that for a second, especially if you're a local government providing power, would you rather simply say, all right, let's see if we can cut the consumption down as a whole and not have to build another plant to basically satiate whatever demand is, is being sort of created. Does that make sense? In other words, you know, should we maybe offer up incentives to sort of say, instead of having to build that extra power plant, or instead of having to build an extra water treatment facility, can we change the behavior on the part of our customers to lower the demand so that we don't actually have to, to generate that extra capacity? Does that make sense? Okay, because most utility providers are not profit-seeking enterprises, okay? And in order to get funds to build the new power plants or whatever it might be, usually that means they're going to have to go to the taxpayers to do that. Okay? May I ask why is it still like uh, four states in the U.S. that are banned lead uh, certification for all their buildings? Like there's four states that banned lead. Yeah, Alabama, Georgia, Missouri, and Maine. Um, Diplomatically, my, 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 my assumption is you have politicians within those states that for whatever reason have chosen yes. to um, take a stance <laughs> take on, a on, on those particular issues. And, 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 it, and it's probably just that. It's politically driven. You know? and, and, and what you may have in certain instances, like for example, there are certain cities that have come up with their own standards, like Austin, Texas. If you look at Austin, Texas, they don't use LEED, but they, they have their own set of standards that they have developed in-house that they feel 
achieve the goals that they want to achieve as opposed to relying on the standards that are set up, set up by LEED. So it's not you know, necessarily that LEED is the one all-encompassing thing, it's just that it's a kind of a, it's an industry standard. But not everybody has to use that same standard, but it, at least it gives some sort of... of it, it gets globally recognized, that's what right. I that's, 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 that's really that's all it boils really down to, is that, that and, and, and people that are in the development industry, you know, whenever they're talking to other folks, they can talk the same language because they're all talking about the same set of standards. But if you go into an area that has their own separate standards, then it's a very, you know, different kind of dialogue, and, and then you're going to have architects and contractors that are going to have to be familiar with what those local standards are. Okay? All right? Any other examples on this item number one up here? I see DC that all schools have to be lead gold. Okay. And once again, another sort of makes my point that I was talking about earlier, that it's much easier for a school district to sort of say, let's do a bond issue to build a, a nice, new, energy efficient school than to have to go to taxpayers every single year and say, we need more money to operate that facility. Yeah. Okay? All right, good. Okay. I'm kind of on Marielle to give you the answer to the second one. I looked and I looked and I looked. And I looked and so, differences in occupancies for energy efficient buildings. Then Who found something? I got um, 16 to 18% higher than non rated buildings. Okay, and where did you find that? Um, the U.S. Department of Energy. Okay. I did a, um, a PDF on, what was it? The Energy Efficiency and Financial Performance. So, okay. okay. That sounds very relevant to us, okay? Paul, what'd you find? Well, kind of going back to what you stated in the beginning of the lecture was kind of the scarcity of public info. So the majority of info out there has been done on surveys of owners of new certified buildings and buildings with energy uh, deficiency in them is how they've got the information. Okay. It's not so public, so it's kind of hard to nail down a, an exact number, if that makes sense. Okay. Anybody else? Take a look. Let's see. The Journal of Sustainable Real Estate. That's a PDF file, right? Well, it's a journal. Okay, so this is a sort of a practitioner slash academic journal that's been around for a few years called the Journal of Sustainable Real Estate and specifically in terms of of the effect of eco-labeling. So this is one aspect of this in terms of occupancy level. And so this, this is one article of several, but here they're basically controlling for differences in age, height, building class. The results suggest that occupancy rates are approximately 8% higher in lead labeled offices and 3% higher in Energy Star labeled uh, buildings. 
So the, the point being is there are different types of research that are out there specifically looking at these kind of issues. This just happens to be one focused, as they're calling it, eco-labeling. So if you call your building in the marketing materials, basically we're saying we have an energy efficient building and we are promoting that, that part of that, just that labeling process could have an effect on your, <coughs> excuse me, on your occupancy rates. Okay, make sense? So let's just see, there was another one that it pulled up just as a, another kind of example of this. How risky are sustainable real estate projects and the valuation of lead and energy star development options? So let's see what their conclusions are here. Um, so basically, we've got in this case, we're just looking at the incremental construction costs in terms of the rate of return that you're getting from those incremental construction costs. So basically, what they're saying is. With the additional cost of construction that you're going, that associated with achieving that certification, that incremental cost of construction relative to the return that that incremental cost of construction has, you're getting a really high return on that, okay? Not the overall return, the overall return is going to be higher, but what they're looking at is the incremental return. So in other words, here's, here's my point. If you're spending an extra dollar per square foot on construction, what they're saying is that potentially you're getting 126 or basically an extra dollar and 26 return on every dollar that you're spending. Okay? You're getting all your money back and an additional 26% on top of that. Okay? So that's just another thing. Okay? So what else is up here? Energy efficiency in separate town spaces, okay, feasibility study, okay, that's not specifically what we're looking at. Um, okay, here's something by CoStar. Okay, so another example of a CoStar study finds Energy Star lead buildings outperform their peers. So once again, they're looking at trying to strengthen the business case, and so what do they got? So lead buildings command rent premiums of $11.33 per square foot over their non-lead peers and have a 4.1% higher occupancy. Um, so once again, more evidence sort of showing what we're, what we're talking about, okay? Like I said, you can find a lot of this stuff on your own too. Okay, so those are a couple of examples of basically the differences in occupancy for energy efficiency, okay? So what about this one? Difference? in energy consumption by LEED or ENERGY STAR standards, okay? Am I finding good stuff on this? Yeah, I found that um, the ENERGY star, STAR standards focuses solely on e e energy re reduction or CO emission re reduction, so there are more buildings that save more in energy by having the ENERGY standard than the LEED, because LEED has seven different categories. Yes. Okay, and that, can focus on you, not all. Yeah, so that, that's the thing I should have mentioned earlier. The LEED standards cover a whole cross-section of factors beyond just energy consumption, okay, and energy efficiency. Whereas Energy Star focuses almost exclusively on just that one piece, on the, the actual energy efficiency piece, okay? All right, but okay, so in terms of the differences between the, the, the consumption, anything? I think is the number I saw. Right? I think I got one here. It's like 13% lower. Yeah, so this one talks a little bit about. energy efficient by designing to exceed energy code or achieving energy star benchmark from the top 30% of the um, buildings, but it still doesn't get specifically to what I was asking, which is what can we expect 
with these different levels of performance. Okay, that one doesn't get at it. What I'm looking for here is to try to see if we can find something that actually gets to basically saying, okay, for LEED certified buildings, we would expect this level of energy consumption per square foot. For LEED silver, we would expect this level of consumption, LEED gold, LEED platinum, okay? Or some other sort of uh, a rating system to basically show, you know, what you would expect in terms of operating cost differences for one standard versus the other. Yep? It says that the electricity and the gas expenses in MG Star buildings are, are more than 13% lower than uh, compared to non rated buildings. Okay. So. All right. Well, there's something for us. Okay. Anybody else? That's the right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Energy Star. Anyone else found anything? Yeah, yeah, I found that Energy Star buildings save, I mean, consume about 30% less energy than conventional buildings. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's move on then. Okay. Living standards for energy efficiency buildings or energy efficient buildings. So one of the articles from the Institute of Market Transformation was financing energy efficiency through mortgage loans, okay? And so this is a great little, it's like four or five pages long, but you know, it's a good little primer clearly on just kind of understanding, and it's brand new, it's just published this year. Uh, but like you know, some of the things that we were just talking about, you know, a reduced default risk, higher loan proceeds are two of the multiple opportunities uh, when lenders you know, take energy efficient, uh, efficiency into consideration. go through and then talk about all the different sorts of things that can be done in terms of just examples of things that can reduce costs in terms of changing out the lighting, changing out uh, different types of uh, um, insulation, a um, whole number of other things, okay? And how that will result obviously in cost savings. Oops. On the bottom says replace inefficient heating plant and mechanical. Yeah, so they basically did two different case studies for two different buildings, sort of side by side, kind of like us. Mm -hmm. And they simply said, what could be done to, to in essence, to save that money back in. Right. You and so what they, much money and so ultimately what they, they did, these two different buildings, they did just kind of a simple payback analysis and saying, okay, if with all these different you know things, what would be the investments, what would be the annual cost savings, what would be the payback period, mm -hmm. okay? Just giving examples. But more specifically, a little bit later in this, which I thought was, was obviously the part that I relate to its numbers with regard to NOI, but you know, saying that the, on, on a property, if you've got a historical NOI of 132,000, but your adjusted NOI with the energy savings picks it up to 151,000, you know, what does that mean in terms of additional available loan proceeds that are going to be available to you on your property, okay? That, in essence, as you increase your NOI, that means that potentially you can borrow more money, okay, to help pay for those things that you maybe put into place and then potentially have a little bit of extra money left over in some cases. A lot of times governments also subsidize programs like this to try to improve. Right? Precisely. Yeah. Yep. Again. Well, that's I, I found on the Fannie Mae website they they have um, lower interest loans and then they they do it based on the certification of like twenty different certifications I guess. Okay. Like Energy Star and a bunch of others. So so that's you know. That's so the point is it exists. Right. I'm not just saying a bunch of random stuff that obviously has no <laughs> basis in reality. Okay. So it okay. exists. All right. Anything else that you guys found on, on the lending standard stuff? Yeah, I found the same. Thing. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but they only see it for multifamily, not for single family homes or okay. okay. All right, moving on. What about the actual construction costs themselves for energy efficiency in terms of cost per square foot? Yep. 
the only thing I, I found single family home and it said it was on average five to ten percent more. Okay. But that was for Okay. Anybody else found any other sort of? Yep. So for commercial, they had a a dollar and eighty cent per, uh, per square foot for the building that saved at least fifty percent of heating and energy system of buildings. That mean, I don't know what it is. It's A S H R A E. Ashry. Yeah, Ashry standards. Yeah. So. Okay. And then um, also they had a another deduction of sixty cents per square foot for measures affecting building. Envelope, lighting, or heating and cooling. Okay. Those type of things. Okay. Anybody else find anything on that one? Yep. Um, there is a lot of information on the USGBC yep. yeah. website. Yep. The US, and US, it breaks it down like into categories, but I think it, it has like the rate per square foot, six to seven cents, depending on the square footage of the building. But then it also has all the fees and the, the flat rates and the per building pre certification, so just all that has to be. See, here's, here's the interesting thing about how LEED works. LEED is based on a series of points, okay? And it's kind of like you've got this whole catalog, if you will, of things that you can get points for. And once you accumulate certain number of points, then you get a certain rating, okay? Now, but not, not all points are created equal. And this is kind of an interesting gamesmanship that goes on with the lead certification process. You can only imagine, once again, if you're serious about getting you know, a certain level of lead certification, whatever it is, whether it's certified, silver, gold, or platinum, that people have taken the time to explore how much does it cost to get us this point versus this point. Like for example, one of the points that you can get is like having bicycle racks. Because that's not an energy efficiency thing, but that is a thing that is from a sustainability perspective of we're encouraging people to bike to work, and so we're gonna have bicycle racks. And so you get a certain point value for that. And then a point value for having then the, the showers where they can change clothes after they've biked in to work, you know, then you get another point for that. Or you get a point for, you know, sort of energy efficient lighting, or you get a point for using renewable natural resources in terms of, you know, types of flooring or types of wall coverings. Or what, but my point about this is that each item has a point value attached to it, but yet this point may cost you $10,000 this point may cost you $100,000, but both are one point. Well, each point gets you to that next level. And so what, sadly, a lot of folks have done is they game the system and they figure out what are the cheapest points to actually get us to you know, the certain standard and then basically play that game of, okay, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with really like the energy efficiency, it's all about getting points. Does that make sense? Okay, because you have to document each of these points and each each item. Okay? All right. Moving forward. Do you think they look down on that? Like, well, of course they down? do, but, but, yeah. but it's it's like they've got to figure out a way that is measurable, doable, you know, documentable, you know, and and they, they, they refined it without question, you know, over time to try to maybe reduce some of that gamesmanship that, that goes on, but to a certain extent, you know, a lot of it is still there. Okay? And, and see, another aspect of it is, you know, sometimes, like with, especially with energy efficiency, at the end of the day, what should really matter is, okay, what is the true reduction and consumption relative to whatever maybe an industry norm is. But here's the thing. The industry norm changes from one year to the next. So what was energy efficient 10 years ago in terms of, let's say, an air conditioning system is not energy efficient today. So they constantly have to update what that standard is you know, from one year to the next. So you may have had, let's say, 
elite platinum building, the highest you could possibly achieve 10 years ago, and that might actually be the equivalent of elite silver today. Do you have to recertify? No. Okay, that's good. So you basically get locked in, at, but, 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 they're, they're very... Well, no, no. What they, what they do is when they give you the plaque, it says lead gold, and it's what you put up on the, on the wall, but it says 2001. <laughs> so, you know, from the standpoint that, you know, you know that, yeah, it, it was 10, 15, 20 years ago that you actually, <laughs> you know, achieved that. So, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily current with respect to what the current standards are. But you can still claim it was lead gold or whatever as of 2001 or whatever the year was, okay? All right, so once again, this last one, government incentives for energy efficiency. What kind of things did you find there? I found you? a bunch of like weird little ones for at the state level. Yep. Like uh, Arizona will uh, pay for up to $500 if you convert your fireplace to a wood burning stove just because it saves wood and trees, I guess. But um, from the federal level, there's a thing called a solar tax credit, yep. which basically allows you to deduct 30% uh, of the ins installation costs that comes with installing solar panels. Yeah, and, and in some locations, they can marry that federal incentive with a state or local incentive to where um, you potentially can get solar panels on your home at no cost to you, mm -hmm. okay? And in actuality, not only would it not be of any cost to you, but at some point, if it generates excess capacity, you may be able to sell that excess yeah. capacity back to the grid. Really? Yeah. They're doing that now. Yeah. yeah, no, they are. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, any other examples, though, of local? Or, no, what's okay? The well, government it's not, um, structurally, you can get, but it could be with permitting processes, okay. um, higher density and height bonuses. Yeah, okay, so there, that's, a, that's an interesting, especially from a developer's perspective, all right? that if you do certain things to make your building more energy efficient, whatever it might be, we're gonna allow you to have higher density as a local government on this particular parcel of land. Well, that, that's obviously a, a significant incentive. If we can build, let's say, one extra apartment unit per acre or two extra units per acre, that is significant to us in, in the sense that that's gonna generate more revenue for us so we're going to be thrilled about that, okay? And also, as you were saying, also height restrictions, which also kind of leads into, I mean, this is all very much of a land use planning slash land use regulation kind of issue, but the, it, it leads into, a, I think, a much broader discussion, which I think is kind of fascinating, and that is, to a certain extent, the arbitrary standards that local government set in the first place as it relates to density, height restrictions, you know, parking requirements, and, and that sort of thing, that, you know, where do those standards come from? Well, in some cases, you could argue, well, they're made based on historic information or best practices or whatever it is, but don't you find it interesting that, that they can, to a certain extent, at a whim, adjust those standards in such a way that all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're saying that um, historically, you know, we would only allow buildings to be four stories in height within our city. But if you make it an energy efficient building, we'll allow you to do five stories. You know, so why can't all other buildings be five stories? Well, because we said so. You, you follow what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what's you know, kind of sometimes a, a bit artificial about some of these kinds of incentives is that all of a sudden you potentially lower the overall kind of thing that the average ordinary person can do, but then we sort of tack on this extra benefit for those folks that are doing the things that we want them to do, if you follow. Which gets into a, a whole other kind of back and forth. Like for example, a lot of governments try to turn it into a, a zero sum game. And what I mean by that is for every person that we give an incentive to, there has to be someone else paying a penalty. You follow what I'm, I'm saying? So, so for, for example, let's say this half of the room over here, which is obviously less than this half in terms of number of people, but we're going to give every single one of you an incentive, you know, to um, build your energy efficient building and, and 
um, you know, we're going to reward you for that, okay, by you know several hundred thousands of dollars, okay. But we're going to fund that by saying you guys over here are building crappy ordinary buildings, and so we're going to charge you a penalty for basically of a hundred thousand dollars per building for building below the standard that we want you to build, and then we're going to take all that money we've generated from those fines or from those fees and we're going to award that to these guys. Okay, does that make sense? And that happens quite often because it's kind of, once again, it's kind of the, the carrot and the stick thing. But once again, you guys are all getting the stick, you know, and, and you guys are all getting the carrot, you know, over here. Yep. I was just going to say they did that kind of with uh, the new AC systems have new gas. So they tax the old gas at a much higher rate. <clears throat> Making it almost unaffordable. Yep. Okay. Uh, 179E commercial buildings energy efficiency tax deduction. Uh, it's on energy.gov. It's, it's just okay. stating that if you install or update or for new buildings and existing buildings, you can get a tax deduction. I, I haven't read the whole thing, but tax deduction of $1.80 per square foot is available to owners of new existing buildings. To install interior lighting building and below heating, cooling, ventilation, or hot water okay. systems that reduce energy by 50%. And so that's, once again, just it feeds into the narrative of, of what I've been saying is that yes, there are incentives out there. It's a question of whether you take advantage of them or not um, as a developer, but you know, the, the awareness hopefully is, is you know, being created that you, know, you need to be looking around for these sorts of things because they could make the difference in some instances of uh, the building being profitable or not being profitable or being more attractive to a prospective tenant by having these features put into place than not having them put into place. So, you know, these are things to, to, to certainly consider. Um, okay. One example that I was hit with several years ago that I thought this is a fascinating story. It was one of my first um, kind of, uh, uh, I guess, exposure to this kind of set of issues. Um, we were taking a group of students um, to Australia for a sustainable sort of development study tour several years ago. And we were visiting um, a variety of different sort of resorts and different government facilities that had all put into place these different um, uh, standards and, and a lot of sort of cutting edge technology and that sort of thing. And so one of the properties that we visited, it was this five star eco resort, okay? Well, I'm sorry? Australia? In Australia, in, in Brisbane specifically. And so we, we go to this resort, I mean, it's, it's the, like the most amazing place that you've ever been. I mean, you know, just absolutely gorgeous, you know, surroundings and, um, you know, very, very tropical. And but it's on this island, you gotta take a boat to get there and you get there. And the thing that they had that was really interesting was in every single one of the rooms, they had monitoring devices for electricity consumption, for water consumption, for sewer usage, for, you know, you know and then for the heating, for, you know, gas, not that you really needed heat, but in terms of like a stove. Um, so they had all these different monitoring devices. And you could turn on the TV in the room, and on the TV it would show what, it, you know, your room with your level of energy consumption in real time, you know, how much water you're using, how much electricity you were using, and, and so forth, so on. And did this for, um, you know, and then show how your performance stacks up with everybody else that's in this particular, you know, resort of, you know, several hundred units, okay? Well, that was interesting. You know, it was kind of cool. Yeah, you could see, you know, what the consumption, you know, like I said, what it was. So if you flick on a light, instantly you see, you know, in essence, the, the meter running and, and um, you know, can see that you're consuming this amount of electricity. But what was interesting is that they thought, okay, we want to sort of almost make a game out of this. And so they would tell you the moment you checked in, if you have the lowest amount of consumption, you get a free room. 
And this is the place, it was like several hundred dollars a night. So obviously, everybody is going to join in to try to, you know, win the free night. So you can imagine the behavior modification that takes place. That, that, that basically, you've got people, you know, not flushing the toilet, not showering, not turning on the lights, not using the air conditioner, you know, just doing everything imaginable to, to have the lowest amount of consumption to potentially win that free night. But the fascinating part about that, beyond that behavioral change, was also how much it impacted their consumption of energy as a whole for the property. That their operating costs were radically below what you would ever expect them to be because of you know, that sort of an environment you know, being sort of fostered. And so I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. This is great. And, you know, and so I walked away from there, you know, and, and um, you know, saying to myself, wow, this is like the best example ever. And I'm going to come back to the story in a second. But um, you try to do that here. <laughs> no. I wouldn't visit the place again 10 years later. Oh, okay. And I'll tell you what happened. But, but before I do that, let's, let's think about this for a second. Imagine in your own homes or in your cars for that matter, that, you know, you know, kind of like with the Nest thermostats and with the, you know, the different things that you have available in your car, that the moment that you turn on an appliance or the moment that you, you know, uh, travel a certain distance or whatever, that you had actual real-time, real-cost information about, you know, every, you know, like, if you think about your car, it's not just the cost of gasoline. It's the cost of maintenance. It's the cost of your car payment or lease payment or, you know, insurance. whatever, insurance and so forth so on. But I mean, imagine if you're like driving down the road and then, you know, you're literally seeing almost like you would in a, in a cab or Uber or whatever that, you know, here is my real cost, you know, for this trip that, you know, all those things included, you know, this trip is really costing me, you know, what, what I'm thinking only in gasoline cost, it's really costing me so much more and you would see that in real time. Don't you think that would modify your behavior a bit? in terms of, of the trips. I mean, realizing that certain trips you've got to do. You've got to, you know, mandatory trips to, you know, work and, and that sort of thing. But in terms of just, for lack of a better description, joy riding around, you know, town, you know, taking that leisurely, whatever, Sunday afternoon drive, you know, would you not maybe be modified to a certain extent in your behavior if you're price sensitive to that sort of stuff? Or more specifically, let's talk about, like, how cold or warm you potentially keep your, you know, where you live, you know, to what extent if you could see in real time what your electric bill was at that moment, and then the moment you flip on the, the lights or the moment you flip on the, the stove or the air conditioning, you could literally see in real time the, the numbers rolling, would that not potentially modify your behavior? Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but whenever I was growing up, my father was one of those Turn off every light whenever you leave the room. You know, make sure you close the door whenever you leave the house. You know, kind of thing. And, and you know, always you know very conscious about that. You know, we're not going to heat and cool the whole neighborhood kind of you know aspect. And my point with that is just simply, you know, barring having somebody you know giving you mandates like that, don't you think that your behavior to a certain extent would be influenced if you actually saw in real time that consumption sort of information? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. to tack on the what you said, I, I'm kind of the same way. My father was like that. Turn the lights off, this and that. So I'm very adamant about that. Turn it off. But there's other members in my household who kind of didn't catch on to the lesson. So coming back to where you are, to maybe to see it in real time, because I have to, because I go around and turn all the lights off behind them or all of that. Well, maybe something like you said to see how much energy they're burning and wasting, maybe you could modify their behavior. I don't, well, I don't and, know. And my, my reason for bringing this up is from a real estate perspective, I, I you know, do we potentially, with that provision of additional information, you know, is that is maybe what is necessary to take things to the next level, you know, in terms of real-time consumption for office tenants, for retail tenants, for, you know, whoever, that maybe, you know, the average ordinary worker may not be overly concerned about that, but if basically the CEO of the company is, then to what extent you know would that be enough to modify the behavior of the people that you know when they leave the office on you know Friday afternoon that they turn off their computers, they you know do whatever recycling that needs to be done, and so forth, so on. 
Well, okay, so that's one thing to sort of think about. Another that I ran across, this happened to also be in Australia, uh, and I'm going to come back to the first example here in a minute, but we went to, to visit this one office building that this building had all these cutting edge technologies with respect to um, whenever the sun would be in a certain position in the sky, automatically the um, blinds in the room or in, the, in the, the building would come down or close or open or whatever, depending on, you know, to basically to try to reduce the heat gain, you know, obviously in the, um, in the, in the building. You'd also have basically the air conditioning system was set up in zones so that depending on, you know, in other words, you wouldn't necessarily uniformly have to cool or heat the whole building all at once. You would only heat and cool the zones that were currently hot or currently cold. Does that make sense? So it was a very sophisticated system that they had put into place. But they also had, you know, some assumptions, you know, built into the, the model one of the architect designed all of this, number one, they never thought about people working at night, okay? And so what ended up happening is you had a number of firms were in this office building that the system was set up to pretty much be kind of like a seven o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night system, and that was how it was sort of modeled from an energy, you know, perspective. And, but what they found was that, you know, throughout the whole building, all the different floors, even with the zone air conditioning, You'd have that lone worker, you know, on each floor that they would have to have air conditioning or, or heating on for that would blow their budget apart because that person was working until one o'clock in the morning or coming in at five o'clock in the morning or, or whatever it might be. And then they had another issue that they really didn't adequately model, which I thought was, was, was interesting, was in these office buildings, they purposely were like, don't have any of your cubicles or office space closer than 10 feet to the windows. And the idea behind that was that's where the majority of the heat is, you know, obviously within you know, a 10 foot distance. Um, but yet, of course, what do the occupants of the building do? Immediately jam everybody right up adjacent, you know, to the windows. And so those people were always hot. Well, then the air conditioning would be working extra hard to try to cool down, you know, those people. So even the best laid plans and intentions don't always have the consequences that you, you know, expect or you have unintended consequences. And that is where it leads me to the end of the story about the other Australian property. This is another really valuable lesson. So I went back to visit this property about 10 years later, and uh, I'm so excited to take you know, a group of students into this property and say, you know, look at all this cutting edge, you know, I'm, I'm just like, in my mind, just, you know, can't wait to see these systems and to see what they've done and see how much better they've made it over the past 10 years. Well, apparently about three years prior to my revisit, the property sold to some new owner investor. And this particular new owner investor didn't care less about any of the energy efficiency kinds of things or you know these you know sort of monitoring devices and, and so forth and so I get to the, to the I, I didn't know that and so I, I get to the room and I'm like you know turning on the TV I'm like where the heck is this you know thing showing me all the consumption it's not there so I go back to the front desk and I say well what's the deal you know I'm looking for this and, and they're like yeah um, the new owners, we got rid of that because that system was incompatible with our movies on demand system. And we make more money off of the movies on demand than we made off of the, the cost savings on the, uh, the utilities. And so it was like, really? You know, um, but, but that was their, their whole reason for, you know, basically getting rid of the system is because, oh, we make more money on movies on demand and it just happened to be an incompatible system. So, you know, it's just like, wow. You know, so it's really interesting when you look at these things and, you know, you do sort of wonder, you know, from a sustainability perspective, just, you know, how long, you know, these things can be sort of expected to, to maintain their benefit or their usefulness or their implementation, you know, is this, is it, this is the thing I, I question constantly about a lot of these things, you know, are they kind of a flash in the pan kind of, you know, everybody's concerned about this right now, but, you know, a couple of years from now, no one really cares, you know. And so we kind of have to, you know, sort of wonder that with all this talk of, 
sustainability and, and, and so forth, you know, is it just that? Is it a fad or is it something that's a bit, you know, longer term in, in nature? But I think the one thing, at least in my own mind, you know, being the numbers guy, you know, the energy efficiency aspect, if that's a true cost savings, you would have to think that's something that people are going to continually strive to try to minimize are the, the cost associated with, with energy consumption. And the fact that, yeah, we do have limited resources, so we probably ought to be concerned about that. Okay? Thoughts, questions, observations? I think the, the problem that a lot of developers run into that it's a function of how long you want to own the property. And that's another, yeah, if absolutely. You're a merchant developer and you're just going to buy the land, build it, and sell it as soon as it's Yeah, what do you, why do you care? Yeah. You really don't, yeah. Yeah, all you're concerned about there is, okay, you know, can I Make basically fun. get the prop? get the property up to a certain level of occupancy, and as soon as I achieve that occupancy level, boom, time to put that property up for sale and, and um, wash your hands of it and move on to the next one. Would you sell it at a lower cap rate on the like energy efficiency? The idea would be yes. I mean, you know, theoretically, yes, you should sell it at a lower cap because it's supposedly lower risk because, once again, you have lower operating cost and hopefully a, a longer sustainable value. So as that merchant developer, would it make sense then, in that case? Like with the well, it would if, sense. once again, you can show and reflect that savings. That savings. And because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, all of this still boils down to our good friend Earth. Okay? For every additional dollar of net operating income that we can generate due to energy cost savings, that's going to have an impact on the underlying value of the property. So that you know, if we can generate you know one dollar of additional income, net operating income, and we have a you know a 10% cap rate, then that's basically saying we have added an extra ten dollars to the underlying value of the property. So, you know, as it was showing on that one slide, where it was saying, okay, your your original NOI was this, your revised NOI is that. Well, that is what's going to translate into you know that value creation. And so, the the whole thing of of, of you know, another way to flip it around is that you could also sort of say, well, if I had to spend ten dollars to put that feature into place, and I have this requirement of a 10% cap rate or rate of return, it better well flow through and give me that extra dollar of income. Now, what you would hope is it actually only generates two or three dollars of income, okay, relative to, to what we've got going on here. But at least at a minimum, it's going to have that incremental sort of revenue generation that makes makes it worthwhile. Anybody else? Thoughts, questions, observations? Okay, let's do a little quiz. Forgot about that, didn't you? Okay.